Welcome to the Manic Metallic Podcast, where we respect fashion's past, analyze fashion's present, and get excited about fashion's future. I'm Liberty Gaiman, founder and creative principal of fashion media company Manic Metallic. Several times per week, I'll bring you episodes about exciting things happening in fashion, discussion about current issues facing the industry, and the places and people that have made the fashion industry great. Be sure to subscribe to our newsletter and follow us on Instagram at the Manic Metallic Podcast and at Manic Metallic, both linked in our show notes. Now, let's get into today's episode. Welcome to the Manic Metallic Podcast. I'm Liberty, your host. In today's episode of our Who Is series, we're going to discuss someone that all too often is looked upon for her troubles rather than what she offered to the fashion industry. We're going to talk about supermodel Gia Karanji. Gia was born on January 29, 1960 in Philadelphia and spent the first part of her childhood in the northeastern portion of the city with her two brothers and parents. Her dad, Joseph Karanji, was a restaurant owner and her mom, Kathleen Karanji, was a homemaker. Her parents' relationship was unstable and eventually became violent, but Gia's home life remained intact until her mom left the family when she was 11. Her mom, Kathleen, left in order to escape Joseph, whom she was afraid would kill her if she did not get away. This hurt Gia greatly because she was especially close to her mom. Their relationship would arguably never recover from that initial abandonment. As she got older, she became part of a friend group that was obsessed with David Bowie. Her Bowie inspiration had its roots in her admiration of his open bisexuality and his fashion sense, both of which hinted at what she would become known for in the public eye. Gia was open about her sexual preference for women from a young age, though she had a couple of dalliances with men as well throughout her life. She began modeling in Philadelphia at age 16 in newspaper ads around the city. While she was modeling, of course, she attended Abraham Lincoln High School and eventually graduated from South Philadelphia High School in 1977. At age 17, she moved to New York to begin what would be a wildly tumultuous life and career. Her first modeling agency, and one at which she'd see most of her success, would be Wilhelmina Models. Agency co-founder Wilhelmina Cooper would become one of Gia's strongest supporters, acting as both a mentor and a mother figure to this beautiful yet lonely young model. Having come to the city as a teenager, she was actually afraid of New York at first because of its large size compared to her hometown of Philadelphia. I'd imagine that as a teenager, going to New York for the first time alone would be extremely intimidating. For example, I didn't go to New York until I was 18 years old, which is only a year after Gia's age when she went for the first time. But... One, I wasn't living there. And two, I was with my college class. I was never alone in New York until I was 24, but I digress. Gia's rise to the top of the modeling industry was quick, with her raking in $100,000 by the time that she was 18 years old, making her the industry's highest paid model. She worked with fashion's top photographic talent, with some of them being Helmut Newton, Francesco Scavulo, Richard Avedon, Arthur Elgort, and Chris von Wangenheim. She appeared on the cover of multiple issues of Cosmopolitan magazine and national and international issues of Vogue, and was featured in the editorials of many more publications. Additionally, she appeared in ads for designers such as Yves Saint Laurent, Armani Versace, and Dior. She even had a cameo in Blondie's Atomic video in 1979. Although she was already casually using drugs, Gia's real decline began upon the death of Wilhelmina Cooper in March of 1980 at age 40 from lung cancer. Gia was devastated and developed a heroin addiction soon after. She left Wilhelmina Models eight months after Wilhelmina's death to sign with Ford Models and was cut within weeks. In the ensuing years was a cycle that would manifest itself as this. Go back to Philadelphia to get clean, return to New York to begin modeling again, relapse, and repeat. During the process, the fashion industry all but cut bait with her, 
out of fear that associating with her would harm their own careers. Gia had moved home to Philadelphia in February of 1981 with their mom and stepfather in an attempt to get clean. She did a 21-day detox program, but was arrested in March of 1981 after driving into a fence. She was under the influence of alcohol and cocaine at the time. After this, she briefly signed with the new agency, Legends, and worked in Europe. In late 1981, she signed with Elite Model Management. As most fashion industry personnel had blacklisted her, she mostly found work for department stores and catalogs. She began using heroin again in 1982 and left New York for the last time in early 1983. Gia lived between Philadelphia and Atlantic City for the last years of her life. She had various jobs during this time, like being a clothing store clerk and a cafeteria nursing home worker. In December of 1985, Gia was admitted to Warminster General Hospital in Warminster, Pennsylvania for pneumonia. A diagnosis of AIDS came a few days later. On October 18, 1986, she was admitted to the hospital again, this time to Hahnemann Hospital. Gia Karanji died a month later on November 18, 1986 of AIDS, becoming one of the first well-known women to pass away from the condition. Her funeral was held on November 23, 1986 in Philadelphia with no fashion industry personnel in attendance. Now, a lot's been made about Gia's life within the cultural landscape throughout the 36 years following her death. The most well-known artistic piece about her was the 1998 HBO film Gia, starring a young Angelina Jolie as Gia. There are a number of other books and films with her life as a subject. Thing of Beauty, a Gia Karanji biography written by writer Stephen Freed, was also written in 1993, five years before the movie came out. Philadelphia Magazine actually published two excerpts from the book around that time. They're very long excerpts, and I've included links to that in the show notes for you to read. Then there was The Self-Destruction of Gia, a documentary created in 2003, and Born This Way, friends, colleagues, and coworkers recall Gia Karanji, a supermodel who defined an era, which is a biography written by Sasha Lanvin Bowman in 2015. Gia's life was tragic in so many ways, and there are parts of her story that are hard to talk about because they're so painful. I've left those pieces out of our podcast today, but you can refer to the links in the show notes to learn more. With respect to her modeling career, she came along and pulled a rug from under the fashion industry at a time when it was obsessed with tall blondes. Being a 5'8", although I've seen many reports that she was 5'7", and that Wilhelmina made a height exception for her, but being a five foot eight brunette model in a world of tall blonde giants was a bold move. Wilhelmina Cooper was a visionary that saw something in Gia that fashion needed. The industry needed to be disrupted. Gia truly paved the way for Cindy Crawford and by extension Kaya Gerber to succeed in modeling. Because if you look at quotes that Cindy has made from the 80s, even she realizes that a lot of her first modeling jobs were obtained by fashion industry insiders that wanted a replacement for Gia Karanji. I've included an article from New York Magazine's October 30th, 1989 issue in which Cindy discusses this in the show notes below. Here's a quote. I was baby Gia, but more wholesome. She was wild, completely opposite me. She'd leave a booking in the clothes to buy cigarettes and not come back for hours. She's not living anymore. End quote. Now, other than that being a fairly odd way of making her point and slightly offensive, saying she's not here anymore, Cindy recognizes the impact that Gia has had on her career. Gia was also unfortunately credited with being one of the first to create the look that models such as Kate Moss and Jodie Kidd became popular for, heroin chic, which I think is a truly offensive term, by the way. The industry should allow Gia to be remembered in a more balanced manner. As a model that, despite her lows, and her lows were crushing, that at her best brought a lot of energy 
beauty and creativity to her work. Isn't that part of what fashion should be? I could go on about Gia's life, but we have to end the podcast eventually. We'll examine this in an article down the road. That's going to be it for this episode. Next up, we've got a really good article discussion coming up. We hope that you'll tune in. See you later. Thanks for listening. If you got value out of today's episode, it'd mean a lot to me if you'd rate, review, and subscribe to the Manic Metallic Podcast. Be sure to tell all of your fashion and client friends and co-workers about the podcast as well. This would really help us to spread our message about fashion being an art, discipline, and a force for societal change. And don't forget to stay in touch with us by subscribing to the Manic Metallic newsletter and following us on Instagram. Feel free to reach out to us through either of those means. I'd love to hear from you. I'll link these all in the show notes. You're the best. See you next episode.